Good morning, friends. This is Janie Seltzer, and I'm broadcasting live here in the Sacred Garden at Hidden Life Ministries, where we focus on each and every Christ follower understanding that their real life is hidden with Christ in God. And so I am going to head up the hill as the spiritual director for the Zig Ziglar family around the world and anyone else. It is my great joy to inspire and encourage you to continue in your journey, your faith journey. And today I'm going to be talking about as a result of my own study and prayer, the three purposes of the potter. So as we head up the hill with Rudy and Sweden, um, I will begin with a poem that talks about what it's like to be on the potter's wheel. Yes, yes, yes. Here we go. There's Rudy. He says, let's go. This poem is called Clay. Dizzy on the potter's wheel, I reel under the pressure of his hand. Water splashes over me. I choke and gasp for air. He cuts off softened chunks refines the shape, remolds the inner core. Hmm. He whistles softly while he works. I listen to the soothing sound and slowly learn Watch, wait for the sovereign shape imaged in his mind. Yes, friends, being on the potter's wheel is not easy for any of us at any time. And we say to the Lord, why does life have to be so challenging? Why? Is there so much loss? Why, oh why, do we meet fresh new challenges all the time? Some very, very painful. Others, tweaks and pains that we can bear. But sometimes the weight is so great that we feel we cannot hold up under it. Why, Lord, why? So, what I have discovered, let me see if I can get the phone to turn around here. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay. Let's see. No? All righty. Well, let's see what we got here. Okay. Yes, as I said, challenges, challenges. There we go. All right, excellent. So as the dogs settle into their spot, I'll settle into mine. I'm here in the prayer shelter where I want you to join me in thinking about the three places that scripture talks about God being the potter and we being the clay. Are you aware that there are three places in scripture? Think about that as I get my Bible out. Um, you're probably familiar with, I'm going to pick up my glasses. All right. You're probably familiar with one of them, maybe two of them, but there are three places where, hi Sweden, where God is described as being the potter. Yes, sit down, baby, sit down, sit down. Oh. 
no, no, no. Oh, you, oh, okay. So <laughs> let me tell you something, friends. We have a new puppy in the house. If you've listened to me or Don recently, Pastor Don, you would know that. And so I keep treats in my pocket. We're training the puppy. And Sweden smells the treats. And so come here, Rudy. All right, sit, sit. You get to do what the puppy does. There you go. Okay, no more. Don't ask for any more. No more begging. <laughs> Aren't we like dogs? We just, uh, no, we're not like dogs. But, you know, we smell the treats and we're like, okay, I want a treat. All right, they'll settle down now. All right, there are three places in scripture that God is described as the potter. And as I studied them, I came up with three things that are true, that the scripture, the word of God, which is my total um, truth that I depend upon. I depend upon the truth of the scripture, whether I like it or not. And I would encourage you, all of you, my friends, to lean in deeply to the word of God because the word of God tells us the true truth. Even, um, very difficult truth and it tastes bitter when we put it into our mouth but as it goes into our system it's sweet and that's what the prophet jeremiah talked about and let's just begin with a, a time of prayer lord jesus i pray that you would come close to all of my friends around the world some of them are on that wheel and they are spinning so fast on the wheel that they don't know which way is up and which way is down. Life is so challenging that they feel like they're going to die and perhaps have experienced death around them. Lord, it is so difficult to be quiet, to be still, and to hear you whistle. Hmm. I pray, hmm, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that the, every heart that is listening right now, every soul would, would lean in to hear your word, to listen to the soothing sound of your voice, the whispers like a whistle, like a gentle whistle that soothe and calm and comfort. Comfort, comfort your people, Holy Spirit. Father God, we ask for your powerful, powerful presence to be with us. And I pray for healing for all those who cry out, Lord, have mercy, have mercy. And for those who are suffering loss, have mercy. You draw near to the brokenhearted, so comfort your brokenhearted ones today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. As I was praying, I realized that I had missed a line in the poem I was quoting as I was coming up the hill, and I knew it, I just couldn't think what it was, and that's why it came out in prayer. So let me repeat the poem, and um, this was given to me many years ago when I was, oh, so, so much on the potter's wheel that I really did not feel that I would survive. And these words, were given to me and I pray that they comfort you and I will um, hopefully quote them correctly this time um, if I can find the poem. Let's see here. It's in my book and it is called Clay and I just found it on page 89. If you've got the book, you can look it up. Dizzy on the potter's wheel I reel under the pressure of his hand. Water splashes over me. I choke and gasp for air. He cuts off softened chunks, refines the shape, remolds the inner core. He whistles while he works. I listen to the soothing sound and slowly learn, relax, wait for the sovereign shape 
imaged in his mind. Hmm. There we are. And in this poem is a lot of information. Um, I have discovered as I've studied the three places where pot, God is called a potter, that this poem actually um, puts a lot of it on in perspective. Little did I know. Let me just tell you what those three things are. The potter does three things. He designs us on the potter's wheel. He disciplines us on the potter's wheel and he destroys us sometimes on the potter's wheel. Now there's a hard word, isn't it? And I think on the heels of saying that, for, I'm gonna take you to the scripture so you can see it, but on the heels of saying it, I want to remind all of you who are listening that no matter what, there is the promise from scripture that in all things, God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if you, my friends, love God, then no matter how devastating and destructive things appear to be around you or within you, if you love God, and if you are called according to his purpose, not yours, his purpose, then he will and does work for good. I've seen it over and over and over again in my own life. At the moment you think this cannot possibly be good. How can children left without parents, how can that be a good thing? Well, you know what? God can make a way, as a friend of mine said this morning, with a tragic situation that we are dealing with in our circle of friends. God will make a way, and he always does. I see all the news just like you do. I know all that is going on, and God will make a way. He will walk through, he will open Whoops, he will part the Red Sea if he has to. He will walk on the water if he has to. He will bring help if we will trust him. Now, let's look at some of the scripture and I want you to remember um, that this is true truth. Um, if you turn, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Isaiah 64. I'm going to read from verses 4 through 8. This is Isaiah speaking. Um, so powerfully to the nation of Israel and to God. Um, Isaiah sort of stands in the middle. He is a true mediator. Um, not in the same way that Jesus is a mediator. He wasn't a mediator for sin, but he was listening deeply to the Spirit of God and speaking out to the people of Israel and speaking to the Lord, asking the Lord questions. So, at verse 4, I begin right there. For since the world began, no ear has heard, and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Whew. Okay, how did my poem end? I listen to the soothing sound and slowly learn. Hold on. Relax. Wait for the sovereign shape imaged in his mind. God has a plan and a purpose. I had to learn to relax, not to carry all the burdens myself. That will surely kill us. 
Stress alone will kill us. Relax, key word. Wait for the sovereign shape imaged in his mind. We do not know the mind of God. Again, his purposes are good in the big picture. So, Isaiah says, <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways, but you have been very angry with us for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? For we are all infected and impure with sin. True truth. And by the way, I'm reading from the NLT, the New Living Translation. Let me read that verse again. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Now that is a famous verse. Even our righteous deeds are filthy rags in comparison with the holiness of God. And by the way, Pastor Don and I are, are doing um, a series in the Sermon on the Mount. We're studying the Lord's Prayer right now. And on Sunday morning, we're going to continue with the second power-packed phrase of the Lord's Prayer. Holy is your name. You see, we don't, we humans, we sinners, we constantly, uh, who constantly sin, who are impure, can't even imagine what holiness really is. So here we go. Even our righteous deeds are filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, here we are in the beginning of autumn, we wither and fall and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Hmm. Powerful statement. Let me read that again. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Wow. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads for your mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. So important what Isaiah is saying here. And it's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1. If we absolutely refuse to ask for forgiveness and be cleansed of our sin on a daily basis, there's a one-time big deal, um, baptism of the Spirit and of the water that that cleanses us, but every single day we need to be asking for forgiveness because our feet get dirty in this filthy world that we live in, as Jesus made clear to the disciples. And as the Apostle Paul said, if we keep on sinning and refuse to turn from our wicked ways, eventually God gives us up. That's what Romans 1 says. So God gave them up. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying. You see, the New Testament of the voice of God and the former, older Testament of the Word of God completely agree with one another. So here he says, Therefore you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. Now listen to verse 8. You're wondering where the potter thing is. Here it comes. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins anymore. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. So Isaiah is boldly, boldly, as should we, don't be afraid to be bold with God, boldly addressing the Lord. Wait a minute here. We are your people. Don't be so angry with us. Does God get angry? Absolutely. 
Jesus even showed it in the temple and at other times, not so fiercely as he did in the temple. Please, God, don't be so angry with us. We are your people. You are the potter. We are the clay. And then he goes on and he says, your holy cities are destroyed. Zion is a wilderness. Yes, Jerusalem is a desolate ruin. The holy and beautiful temple where our ancestors praised you have been burned down and all the things of beauty are destroyed. Listen to that. All the things of beauty are destroyed. And that's what happens. That's what sin does. Sin destroys beauty in our lives. And, and then Isaiah goes on. After all this, Lord, must you still refuse to help us? Will you continue to be silent and punish us? Don't you feel like that sometimes? Really, Lord? Aren't you done yet? <laughs> uh, really? I, I, uh, this is like, this is like um, over and over and over again. This is like Groundhog Day. Are we starting over again, Lord? And, and then in chapter 65, the Lord responds. He responds, aren't we glad? He responds, we have a dialect, a, 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 a God who dialogues with us. I was going to say dialectical God. That's not exactly accurate. That's the wrong word. We have a God who is willing to dialogue with us. If we will address him boldly, he will answer. If we'll wait, we'll hear an answer. And here he comes with Isaiah and the people of Israel. I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. Wow, is that a powerful statement? I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. Friends, are you asking? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Keep on asking and it shall be given unto you. Keep on seeking and you shall find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened. And I was ready to be found, the Lord said, but no one was looking for me. Are you looking for him, friends? Look for God every day, every day. Look for him. It is the sight of the Lord God that gives us breath. As I like to say, prayer is our vital air. It is the sight of the Lord. And you say, well, we can't see the Lord. Oh, yes, we can. With our eyes of faith. He will turn up the lights to show us his sacred presence every single day. If you will walk yourself through the Lord's prayer and when we get, when you get to that line, now I've, I'm, I'm praying it differently as I've studied it more and more. Instead of give us this day, our daily bread, pray, give us this day, your sacred presence. Because you see, he promised his sacred presence with us and for us. So, so he is at our right hand. We can see him in our soul if we will remember he's there. Are you looking for him? Are you asking for help? The Lord even goes on more deeply and says, All day long I opened my arms to a rebellious people. Listen to that. The Lord is standing, not only standing beside you with love, his arms are wide open even to a rebellious people. How more clear could that be? If you have been rebellious, it's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but it's never too late. It's never too late. His arms are wide open to a rebellious people, he says. That's the word of God. His arms are open, friends. Just, just run into his arms like a child. Oh, Abba, Daddy, I need you. I'm so, I'm so frightened. I'm so overwhelmed with sorrow. I'm so scared of life. I'm so, I feel so vulnerable. I, there's so many things going on in this world. I don't know where to turn. And he says, turn to me. I'm right here, my child. I will hold you. I will love you. I will design you according to my beautiful plan. I'll bring the beauty back again. And he does. He does. So there, then he goes on, he says, but they refused. Now, 
I'm not, I'm gonna stop right there because I, well, that was a loud truck up on the hill because I don't want it to end with a sad note. I want it to end right there. My arms are wide open. Now, it goes on and he says, but you know, no one, no one responded. And so I had to do what I had to do. Now, let's go into Jeremiah and let's just see what else he has to say about being the potter in our life. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 18, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He was a lot like Isaiah. He was a prophet. He listened. He spoke. He spoke. He listened. He spoke. He listened. That's what a prophet does. And so the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So as he told me, I found the potter working at his wheel, but the jar he was making did not turn out, turn out as he hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message, O oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to the clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, but then the nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. Nineveh is a great example of that with the prophet Jonah. Nineveh repented, a very pagan, evil nation, and the Lord withheld his judgment. So here we go. But when that nation, okay, and if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. There you go. So there you, there you have it. God, again, it sounds, I mean, there's the destruction part. Okay, so what did I start out by saying? The potter is doing one of three things, and it all depends on the pot. What kind of pot are you? Are you a pot that is a container for the Holy Spirit of God? Okay, then when you're on the potter's wheel, he is going to make you even more beautiful because his designs are beautiful. He is sort of a, a little here and a little there, changing, changing some things, making it more, making you more radiant with his own purpose in life. Okay. If, if that's the pot you are with the Holy Spirit living within, he's, he's renovating and, and designing. Okay. If you're a pot that is sitting there out in the weather, getting more and more weathered every day, not sitting in the sunshine, but in the dark, not being uh, filled with beautiful things, but instead allowing mold and, and rot to creep in, then he, and, and the Holy Spirit is there, he's gotta discipline you. He's gotta discipline me. He's got to discipline all of us because we're his, we're in his hand, we're his pot. So God is working for good there. But number three, if we are just a completely broken down pot, there's another place in scripture where it talks about a broken down wall, but we're a broken down pot and there's no, that does not contain the Holy Spirit at all, just filled with the world and the, the, the things of the world and it, it, all the glitter and glamour is just rusted and faded and going away. If we're that kind of pot, he's got to destroy that pot in order to make something new. Behold, I make all things new. So God's purpose in destruction even is not to harm if the person is willing for God to make them more like him to make them a a, a a vessel of beauty then god will destroy that old stuff and build up something very beautiful so it's a win-win situation all across the board 
Did I say it was easy? No. Did I say it's pleasant? No. No one likes change. No one likes to be taken out of their comfort zone. Renovation is difficult. Um, <sighs> I just couldn't help but think of people who've renovated their homes and practically gotten a divorce over it. Um, I know of another family that the whole house was torn down and a new one being built and that almost destroyed their marriage. So, you know, renovation and reconstruction, it's all hard stuff, right? But if we are keeping God in the mix, what did he say? He only said, he said, those who are, are you looking for me? Are you calling, asking me? Two things, asking Friends, it all depends on the pot. It all on the pot. Working with the potter, saying yes to the pot. Dizzy on the potter's wheel, I reel under the pressure of his hand. Water splashes over me, I and gasp for air. Hmm. He cuts off softened chunks. What's the next line? He saw, he cuts off softened chunks, refines the shape, <laughs> remolds the inner core. Yes, all of that, all of that. Now, the, the, the money, the money, the power in this whole poem is one simple line, the one I think I left out coming up the hill, which is, he whistles while he works. Hmm. Listen to the whistle. Listen to the whispers. I listen to the soothing sound and slowly learn, relax, wait for the sovereign shape imaged in his mind. And with that, I'll finish up real quickly with the third place that the potter is mentioned. And it's more than a mention actually, but I won't say a lot about it because time has run out. It is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, with this. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not ourselves. How about that for an end? This makes it clear that our great, did you ever notice that? Our great power is from God and not from ourselves. Friends, I know this, this broadcast has gone in and out a little bit, but I hope and pray you have received some nourishment for your soul. If you want to be a person of power, let God spin you on the potter's wheel. He does good work and he is a good God. He will make a way to make you beautiful in his sight. Let the potter do his work, my friends. Until next time, and I hope to see you Sunday morning with much love to God be the glory. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling away and who will bring us with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, power, authority, and dominion belong to him who is before all time is in the present and is forevermore. Would you like and share this on your Facebook page? And friends, may God be with you and keep you on that wheel. Until next time, goodbye.